Oh, it's one, two, three strikes, you're out at the old ball game. Take me out to the ball game. Take me out with the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and cracker jacks. I don't care if I ever get back. Let me for the home team If they don't win it's a shame For it's one, two, three strikes You're out at the old ball game Welcome to Let's Get Two The baseball podcast from the fans' perspective Now here's your host, James Christopher and welcome to Let's Get To. I am your host, James Christopher, and we are here starting our baseball week at beautiful Constellation Field, home of the Sugarland Skeeters. We're out here for Media Day to talk a little bit about their pod league as they're getting ready to kick off in about a week or so. We're going to have a lot of members of those teams, the coaching staffs on the show. Should be a lot of fun. And then after this, we're heading up to Round Rock to check out the home opener of the Harry Men. So like I said, we've got a busy baseball week ahead of us, and we have a busy show. We're going to be talking to Darian Stills Evans. He's a filmmaker, writer, big baseball fan. We'll talk a little bit about his New York Mets, the state of baseball today, and kind of where we're going as a sport. So like I said, very packed episode of Let's Get Two, so stay with us. This just in, news from Minor League Baseball. So on the breaking news segment, we had the opportunity to participate in Media Day for the Constellation Energy League. Now, the Constellation Energy League is the brainchild of the Sugarland Skeeters. It's a four-team pod, similar to some of the other pods in the Collegiate Summer League towns, but these players are made up of some of the newly released minor league players that were released as a result of COVID, former major leaguers, some draftees. It's an opportunity for them to play, keep their skills sharp, and in some cases, people not knowing how the major league season is going to go, get a call to the show. And on a personal note, I've always been pretty transparent when things affect me, that fan part of me. You know, this is a baseball podcast from the fan's perspective. So I'm allowed to not always be the journalist because I'm not a journalist. But it was very neat to get to ask questions of players that were heroes growing up. Pete and Cavilia still hit one of the hardest home runs in the Astrodome that I have ever I've ever seen. Greg Swindell, who Longhorn legend, and then I watch him on the Longhorn Network covering the UT baseball team, and of course, Roger Clemens and the interplay with his son. So it was a lot of fun. And so here are some of the interviews and some of the batting practice that we got to watch. It started out with Pete Incavelia being asked about the makeup of the roster for the Constellation Energy League. Well, I mean, it's, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of really good players coming in, you know, lots of guys that played in the big leagues last year, guys that played in the big leagues the year before. Lots of AAA players, uh, a lot of AA guys. You know, we have, uh, matter of fact, we have several affiliated guys, top prospects by Major League Baseball. Uh, you know, they all have dreams and aspirations of playing in the big leagues. And that's what independence for, is uh, to give them an opportunity to showcase their talents. And, uh, you know, I've talked to just about, you know, every organization and uh, they're sending all their scouts here and, you know, th they got a unique opportunity. And uh, the discussion we were having back there is that, you know, we have a unique opportunity because we can play. So we have to respect the COVID and make sure we're, you know, doing our social distancing. And, uh, you know, we, players are getting checked when they walked in, you know, they get a green band and make sure they're clear with no fever and, we did all our COVID tests yesterday, and um, you know we're gonna uh, we'll do COVID tests once a week. So, and I got a chance to ask him what it meant to the fans to get a little bit of a break from Fox News and CNN and COVID, take a little bit of time off and watch some American baseball. Man, you know, I mean, I'll tell you, I've been sitting at home for three months, and I can tell you, I'm happier, than, you know, than anybody to be back out here on the field and getting to do something I love to do, which is, you know, be on the field and you know. You know, hopefully help some players get better and, and get picked up and get to the big leagues. But, I mean, you know, I know some of our games are going to be on TV. I figure if 
they're watching, you know, two in the morning Korean baseball. I figure, you know, that they'll watch, you know, you know, our own, our own homegrown American players and guys that, you know, have big league time and have great resumes. Now, Kobe Clemens took the podium and he was asked immediately what it would be like to co-manage with his father. Like I was saying earlier, not only managing with my dad, but also have, be able to push my brothers around on my team. So that, that, that'll be a lot of fun. But no, you know, I had the opportunity of playing as a third baseman with my dad in Lexington and then caught him in a game here. And then my brothers got to do the alumni game at Texas. So I have all all of us together in, in an environment and you know on a baseball field that's you know our family legacy of wanting to, of loving to play baseball it's gonna be a fun environment to have us all all here getting after but you know we've got you know, highly talented guys like pete my dad greg swindell i mean all these managers and coaching staff here too it's just worth the knowledge for these guys to take advantage of as well who's gonna be calling the shots my dad yeah. i'm the manager he's assisting I, 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 hey he's he's you go out there and talk to that pitcher no, no. we're gonna have fun it's gonna be awesome I had a chance to ask Kobe Clemens about all the former Longhorns on the team, whether or not they'd be wearing burnt orange, and if the eyes of Texas would be saying before games. You know, looking at the roster now, it's it, it is very very burnt orange roster affiliated, and uh, and I, I don't know if we got the rights to, to do that with uh, through Texas, but uh, but no, you can almost ta- call us mini Longhorns with how many Longhorns we have on this roster. That's all I'll refer to you as from now on. <laughs> And then Roger Clemens took the podium. Yeah, it's great. I mean, I'm excited for these younger players to um, the guys that are actually with professional teams right now to stay sharp. We've talked about it. I've talked to Pete. I've talked to Kobe, the other managers, uh, Dave and uh, Greg. You know, you can't as a minor league guy, you can't sit 12, 14 months without seeing live arms or some competition. So it was about two months ago we were here working out and uh, we kind of started talking about it with the Zalotniks and and really – uh, Bob and Kevin, I tip my hat to them. I mean, they're the ones really getting behind this and uh, making this happen for these guys. And just like the talk we had with this group, we'll have it with the other group. And, uh, you know, how serious to take, you know, what you're doing as far as your health risks at the stadium and away from the stadium. So if, in fact, they do have some fans that are able to come see uh, the games, you know, everybody will feel safe and will be able to enjoy some baseball. So, uh, but other than that, I, I you know the facility is unbelievable i think um i think at least 50 percent of the guys are from outside the houston area it was asked about how roger and his son would work together as they're managing the team <laughs> he, he's calling the shots and i'm handing the paperwork over as of today and i get to wash my hands and i'm gonna head to tahoe for a few days and play in the american century i'll come back and check on the boys he says he will be seeing his mouth oh will he <laughs> they'll, they'll hear me from the dugout <laughs> Roger was asked about the comparison between managing a baseball team now and playing for the Yankees after 9-11. Yeah, I mean, obviously, a, immense difference. Uh, you know, when I pitched after 9-11, I was supposed to pitch the night of 9-11 in New York City, and then I pitched, uh, I think, in Comiskey when we came back uh, as a New York Yankee there uh, playing the White Sox. And very emotional. Um, you know, not a dry eye around. It was super emotional, man. You listening to our anthem and – just the patriotic, uh, you know, situation that we had that night was super special. Um, and again, for this situation here, it's all about these guys. It's all about these young men. And again, the Zalotniks for being able to put this together so fast. And uh, just like we talked to the boys about respecting what they're doing, respecting themselves and doing it right here on the field. And then when they're not uh, on the field, when they're at the hotel or around, you got to kind of stay in your little bubble like we've been doing as a family the best we can. And um we're going to be tested. We got tested. We got tested. I got tested five days ago before this worked out, so everything was good. And and uh, everybody in my extended family knows the deal that you know I'm not being unsocial. I'm just kind of staying, trying to do my part, and hopefully the young men here will do the same. And then I had the chance to ask him about the makeup of the rosters with the availability of so much minor and major league talent due to COVID-19. Well, this, this has gone way past the uh, independent league right here. We've got guys, I mean, you're going to see some big arms out here. And uh, I've looked at the rosters and uh, these guys, these boys are going to get tested. These young men are going to get tested pretty quick. Just told them to take it easy, maybe the first few games, you know, until their legs get under them because putting your cleats on and getting, you know, in a spring training setting, uh, you're going to get sore. And uh, these guys will get sore. It doesn't matter if you're 25 or you're 45. You're going to feel a little bit different you know, pitching to live hitters and things like that. But that's what these guys need to stay sharp 
So after two months, I mean, I, I'm not going to be surprised that if some stuff happens in the big league camps where they lose a few players, whether it be injury or from COVID, there's there's more than a handful here that are going to have 40 or 50 at bats. They can go right into play if they if the team calls them to do so. They'll be ready. When we talked to Greg Swindell, I immediately wanted to ask him about the effect that COVID-19 had on shutting down the University of Texas Longhorns baseball season, and particularly the seniors. Well, I mean, fortunately, some of them come back. So um, it, 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 it was terrible that it happened like it did because they were just shut down and, and they couldn't they didn't know uh, what the outcome was going to be. But it, eventually, uh, NCAA, in my opinion, made the, the right move, let the seniors come back. And there's going to be some stacked, stacked rosters next year, I know for sure. So after that, it was batting practice. It was cracks of bats, and it was Pete Incaviglia hitting fungo and Roger Clemens fielding the ball at first base. And then, of course, like any good Longhorn, my day was made when the Rocket gave me a hearty horns up as I left the ball field. So I really want to thank the Sugarland Skeeters and Tyler Stam and Ryan Posner, two of the best guys in the business, for having us out. It really means a lot. And before we go, I want to share with you the four identities that we'll be playing. You've got the Sugarland Skeeters, the Sugarland Lightning Sloths, Team Texas, and the Eastern Reyes del Tigre which should look familiar. It's going to be a blast this summer. Ticket information is available. And just like the Round Rock Express, they are being very, very deliberate about public safety. You should feel safe going out to these games. Who's on first? The Let's Get To Local 9, brought to you by Marco Fine Arts. So we are excited to welcome to the Who's On First segment, friend of the show, J.D. Davis of the Corpus Christi Hooks. J.D., how's it going, man? It's going well, you know, we're, uh, we're excited to be hosting the Astros taxi squad here in a couple of weeks down in Corpus Christi and um, can't wait to get those guys down here and just um, trying to get the ballpark ready. You know, it's, it's a busy time. Uh, we've got a lot of big improvements and big investments that uh, not only the Astros are making, but the city of Corpus Christi are making in the ballpark. And so um, just, just a long checklist of things we're trying to get done and uh, get fans back in the ballpark. So talk a little bit about that, because that was um, I'm guessing y'all maybe knew for a little while that was a possibility because it seemed like the announcement went schedules over a season is over for MILB five seconds later. Y'all are the taxi quads. What does what all does that mean for you guys? Yeah. So, you know, it's something, um, it's kind of, you know, kind of the behind the scenes thing is a little bit of a roller coaster because there was, there was talk of, you know, we may be the taxi squad. Um, once the, once the agreement was made with the players and then it was like, Oh no, it's definitely what they're not going to come here. MLB doesn't want this or that. And, and it was all kind of based on distance. And then, um, you know, just, a, just a couple of days out from that, it was like, no, they're definitely coming and, you know, let's, let's get all that stuff rolling. And so, um, you know, for us, what, it, what it's going to mean is that, um, one, it gives a lot of our, our staff something to, to work towards and something to work for, you know, as we've seen cases and, and things go back up here in Corpus, it's, you know, going to be even more difficult for us to, to have fans in the ballpark, um, anytime in the near future. And so having, having this, it gives us an opportunity to do something, especially on, you know, you look at our clubhouse manager and our operations team and, and folks like that, that are, that are staying busy with that on the marketing side, we're excited because you know, we're going to be able to showcase a little bit of baseball and it's not going to be in the way that we're used to. And, and um, you know, what, what we do, you know, year in and year out, but it is a chance to, to have some baseball played at Whataburger field. And we're coming up with, with ways that we can do that, whether it's through Facebook live streams where folks can, can tune in and watch doing oh. some interviews with players and things like that, where we're able, you know, obviously we, they need to stay healthy and, and we need to, you know, stay separate as, as much as possible. But looking at those regulations that major league baseball has put into place, how can we create content based off of that? And because, you know, normally every now and then we have guys that start with the hooks that may make it up to the big leagues that year. Um, you know, obviously Altuve skipped, uh, skipped triple A completely went straight from, from Corpus Christi last year. Uh, Jose Urquidy was our opening day starter ends up pitching in the world series. And so we're used to that. But in this case, it's like anybody that gets, that gets called up is going straight up there. And so we're going to, we want to have that content ready um, so that fans know who this player is, if they haven't seen him before, get to meet them and get to see them and, and really, you know, be that focal point for Astros fans on who's developing and who's, who's ready to come up. Now you talked about, um, or you mentioned our, before we started that, are you having to do anything to the facility to make it more major league ready? Like, like it's already the best park in, in, in the minors. What all are you, what all are you having to do? 
You know, I think the good thing is there's nothing that's, um, we, ha- we haven't had anything that's been required outside of, you know, setting some designated entrances for, for certain staff and, and players and, and kind of going through that whole process. But um, this is really coinciding with this huge investment that the Astros and that the city of Corpus Christi have partnered on um, this year. And, and when the pandemic came, it's like some of those projects uh, were put on pause and we we're trying to figure out exactly. And now that we have this date, we're ramping back up. And so uh, on my side, I'm, I'm most excited about from the marketing ballpark entertainment side is we are um, changing some existing signage, some, some tri visions that rotate around from three different sponsors to be outfield led digital boards. So that's a fan facing oh. thing. You know, you've seen that in, in places uh, you know, you know, Frisco has, has some stuff like that. I know Round Rock has some, some stuff like that. And so we're really excited that um, I think we're going to be like tripling our video board space because of where all those are going to go in the outfield. And that's, again, this is all uh, thanks to an investment that the Astros are making and that the city of Corpus Christi is making um, in Whataburger Field. On the player side, we've completely, we've already remodeled and finished uh, a brand new weight room area for the players. And so they've expanded that, made it bigger, um, all new equipment. Uh, it's re- I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's night and day different than what it was. Um, and so when they're going into the weight room every day, they're, they're going to be able to, to um, experience that. It's, you know, it's kind of the difference between going into the musty old gym to work out and going into this bright, you know, there's, it's, it's lit well and it's, right. you know, there's new equipment, everything's shiny and new and it's really, really nice. Um, right now, uh, we are in the middle of gutting the entire clubhouse and refinishing and remodeling the, the whole clubhouse. And so that's going to, um, you know, they're, they're moving some walls, expanding. And so it's really, it's going to open the space up. It's going to be a lot bigger. Um, but we want this to be, you know, first class facility for the players. Another project that we finished was uh, in closing our batting cages. So if you've been to Waterburger Field out in left field, we have our batting cages. They've been covered, you know, and so they're, they're in the shade, um, but there was an open wall. And so in Corpus, it's, you know, 90 degrees in the summertime <laughs> and it's hot. You know, even when you're yeah. trying to work out in the shade, it's hot out there. We've enclosed that. It's air conditioned now. Um, and so that, that's going to be a huge, huge upgrade for, for the players that are coming through here. Um, and then we have some other, there's some other fan things. We've got uh, some additional things on the concourse that we're working on, um, you know, some extra uh, uh, concourse boxes that we're kind of creating for fans that they can experience. And um, we've redone some flooring and things like that. It's, it's really been a, a fun um, off season. I wish we were able to unveil all this stuff. You know, we were, we were kind of on yeah. deck to unveil this all before the season. And then when things got put on hold, now we're kind of, um, we've stretched it out. We're working on it now, but um, we're really, really excited to see uh, how fans respond and, and how the players respond when they come in. It's going to be like a brand new ballpark. So when you talk about the taxi squad, um, I love, I love the idea of that you guys are going to try to put the stuff on Facebook live. I mean, it's something I didn't even think about until you said it. So I know that you're a video guy, like you're a media guy. How excited are you about that to get to show us a little bit different look into baseball? Yeah, I think it's really exciting because, um, you, you know, there's a lot of things that we do that it's like, well, this is the way that it's done. We broadcast the game and we try to kind of mimic you know, what do you see on ESPN? What do you see on AT&T Sportsnet when you're watching a game? That's what we want to produce with our typical minor league live stream. With this being so different, um, I, I really like the idea of us kind of experimenting with some with some new things. And, you know, we may have a, a broadcast, you know, per se, of, of kind of commenting on what's going on in the inner squad game or something like that. But it doesn't have to be a, a traditional baseball broadcast right. the way that you, you know, what you're what you're so used to. And I think, we, we can kind of have fun with it and do something a little different. And so I'm really, really excited to see what comes out of that and how we can kind of push the boundaries. And maybe there's something that we try and it falls on its face. And it's like, that was lame. Let's never do that again. But maybe there's something that we do that works really well. And we say, you know what, maybe we can incorporate this into a regular game and, and kind of go from there. You know, I, uh, I'm being the millennial person that I am, you know, I, I like, I'm, I'm a baseball fan, diehard baseball fan. So I love, you know, listening to um, the, uh, the classic announcers and, and calling the game in that traditional way. But I also, I kind of like the idea of like, what would it be like if it was just two friends that were, you know, oh, what, what's yeah. the conversation like when they're watching a game and, and it's people that are compelling. And, you know, we see that with, um, uh, there, there's, there's, there's the Twitter and, and like YouTube folks that are already kind of doing things like that. You know, um, you'd look at uh, Suspetta's family barbecue or something and it's like, what, what's it look like if they broadcast a game instead of, you know, Joe Buck, is that a fun experience? Is that something cool? Can we create that at the minor league level? Um, you know, or, you know, and, and coming from the Astros, this is, I, you know, I don't want to take this the wrong way, but like somebody like John boy and, and like the character that he has, 
even if you're not a fan of like what he does. Thank you for calling him a character, by the way. <laughs> the character. It's, it's yeah. a character. It's a, yeah. But like, if, if that's your stop, like what would it be like to listen to, to him and, and the guys that he does a podcast with call a game, quote unquote, but it's not in the broadcast booth. They're in the, you know, they're in the cheap seats in the bleachers and they're going to be having a conversation about anything. Um, I'm not saying that this should replace or, you know, supersede it, but maybe we get a chance to do something that's more informal like that and a little more fun. Um, and, and we see where it takes us. I think that's a great idea. Honestly, I think, um, for as much as I, I'm like you, like Milo Hamilton is my guy. Right. But, um, you know, I think one of the things that people, I think the reason why people hate Joe Buck is because he doesn't know the players, but what if it was Joe Buck and um, Blummer and the color guy from the opposing team? And now you've got a three man booth. You know what I mean? I love that idea. And look, I'm a John Boyd fan for as much as I just hate when people call him a journalist because he doesn't call, I mean, I'm not a journalist. He's not a journalist. Um, It sounds like you guys are doing your thing as far as pivoting and making the best out of not a great situation. Corpus has probably the most loyal fan base in the minor league, in minor league baseball. How did they take the cancellation and how are you trying to turn that into pivoting for 2021? Yeah. You know, it's been really, really positive from, I mean, as positive as, you know, I don't want to say they're excited, but, but in terms of um, understanding what it was, I think that's the, the, the biggest question for us was a lot of people see the hooks and we are the local team and they don't think about us in the scheme of minor league baseball being a nationwide, you know, 150 plus teams and what that means. And so our worry was always, well, they're going to say, Oh, you know, the, the hook season is canceled. It's like, well, things are fine here. Or why can't, you know, what's wrong with playing these teams or that's teams. It's like, it's not that big of a deal, but, but really overall the response has been fantastic. Um, you know, I, and I credit this mostly to our, our season membership team and our sponsorship team reaching out individually to those folks. And this was right away. You know, as soon as we were out of the office, we, we had messages and, and we're reaching out to folks and answering questions and being as transparent as possible, letting them know where we were in the process. Um, but, but overall, everybody's been really, you know, been really positive. And um, you know, the, the thing that I keep hearing over and over again is like, Hey, we understand we can't wait to be there in 2021. You know, we want to be there opening day. And, you know, that's, that's us being lucky to be in the community that we're in that loves the hooks, loves baseball as much as they do. Um, but also Testament, I think too, I always look back, uh, I've been in Corpus now. Um, this would have been my, uh, my uh, eighth season here in Corpus. Um, and I look back as, you know, the foundation of what the team, you know, meant with, with, Ryan Sanders and, and Reed and, and uh, JJ Gotch and those guys um, that came down and set this team up and really put it, uh, created it as a community staple. We are members of the community um, and did that from the start. And, and we're still living off that goodwill that they created such a long time ago. I guess last question then is, you know, you guys have done an amazing job on social media. You've, you've had your weekly stuff. You've had the cookouts, all those things. Um, are y'all going to keep that going? As much as you yeah, can. we actually, you know, we just had a, a call this morning and we're trying to figure out, you know, what is it, what is a, the backyard bash look like if we, uh, if we're doing it at the stadium while there's a, um, while there's a taxi squad game going on, what, you know, what can we do with that? Can that be fun? Can we do something cool? Um, and so maybe that, you know, that kind of feeds into what we, you know, what we were talking about while I go with what's a different broadcast look like. Can we do something cool with that? Um, you know, we've started, you know, you've inspired us. We're doing a podcast on a weekly basis now. And, and that's Thank something you. Our, uh, you know, our communications team is saying, hey, you know what, like we could just like this is not a a COVID pandemic related thing. Like this is just content that we could keep putting out and keep working on. And so we got a lot of fun with that. It's been great because it gives us a chance to talk a little bit of baseball, but then talk a little bit of community and, and what's going on in Corpus, which is always um you know, that, that's the, that's the fun part to us is we, you know, we see the impact that, that us and those that we work with can make in the community. So we're going to keep that up and uh, we're going to, you know, try as many new things right now. I'm I'm working on um, how do we bring the, the in-game entertainment, some, some on-field contests to, uh, to Facebook live and, and some digital formats. And so, you know, we're, we're working on something there that I'm hoping that we, that we have in the next couple of weeks. Um, And so uh, I've got some tests that we're doing. Um, And then also we've got, um, you know, we've got a really big announcement that's coming in, uh, in probably two weeks from when we're recording this. Don't know when this will go live, but it's going to be the end of July. We've got a really big announcement and um, I really, really can't wait. This is a project that we've been working on for over a year and um, we decided we weren't going to let the pandemic slow us down here. And so um, it's going to be a lot of fun and I know everybody's going to be really excited about that. So definitely check us out at the end of the month and uh, you'll see what we're talking about. 
From the Bleachers, the Let's Get To Game of the Week. So we're back here with From the Bleachers, and Jessica, the newly internet famous <laughs> Jessica, <Yes>. <laughs> is back with us. Um, and we were in Round Rock last night, so let's talk about that beginning with um, the social distancing stuff. So your mm-hmm. affairs and events and, and that kind of thing, professionally, what was your take on how they did? I mean, I was literally taking photos of everything I saw because I was seeing such great examples of how to run a large outdoor live event, uh, which, like you said, is the industry that I work in normally at fairs and festivals. And so I was very impressed by everything we saw at the Dell Diamond uh, last night. So what stuck out the most? Because I kind of had an inside knowledge from Media Day, but as somebody who walked in and it was new to it. Well, I would say when you very first walk up, it's the the signage is really extremely clear on the mask requirements, the six feet of distance. And then, of course, on the floor, everything is marked to show you where six feet is from each other. So if you're standing in a line to get in or you're standing in line to get some drinks or, or concessions, you've got the lines to stand on. But really, one of the things that I thought was most impressive was seeing how they have the one way traffic on their concourse. Right. When I saw that, that was to me was like, oh, it never even occurred to me that passing people this way uh, could theoretically transmit the virus. And I think, you know, some might say that's overkill, but I think I think so much of where we are, it's about people's comfort level. Absolutely. And I felt comfortable. I've told my clients this all the time. It's all about getting people to actually come to your events. And in this time when people are not sure what it's going to look like to come back to a live events, I think anything you can do to help promote the the idea that you're doing everything possible to make it as safe as possible. And I also think, too, it's so, um, you know, as a compliment to them. I think the people that are going are going to see this, remember it, and it's going to pay off for them in the in, in the long run when we move past this. And they're going to remember, oh, Round Rock tried to take care of us. They Absolutely. weren't just trying to grab money. Absolutely. And I, I, I've got to say, too, you know, when I've been working in the on the event side of things. You know, sponsors don't really want to get involved either if they feel like it's not going to be a safe environment. And so I feel like it's going to enhance their capability to get get and keep good sponsorships if the sponsors feel like they're going to be taken care of and the fans will be taken care of. And therefore, their name can be associated with a really good reputation. That also is going to make a big impact for the for the organization as a whole. One of the things that I think both of us detected, though, was they did a great job with the seating with every other row, middles of rows. And then essentially you have a row to yourself. Right. Every time somebody misread their section and wanted to sit <laughs> in our section like three seats away. And I was like, like at what point do I, am I just like, uh, no, sir. <laughs> the anxiety uh. level was high as people were finding their seats. Yeah. But that really ended by the time the first inning was over with. Everybody was pretty much navigated to where they needed to be. Um I don't know if we mentioned it, but you could take your mask off as long as you were sitting in your seat. And yeah. so from that standpoint, you could still get your dogs and your beer and have a good time. And, you know, it was also just nice that from a comfort level, you were, you've you got room to spread out a little bit. Um, and we had a, great, a lot of great conversation with some of the yeah, other, yeah, that other the thing fans in the audience. You were still able to talk to people. Like, Absolutely. Like, yeah. even though they were two rows ahead of you and then down... You know, we had a conversation going, one real pleasant with the lady in front of us and one sort of okay with the guy behind us, <laughs> yeah. Rangers fans. Um, well, no, yeah. He was perfectly nice. <laughs> it, but, was, it was good. Uh, <laughs> the ball game, such as it was. Interesting scenario because it was definitely a situation where one team was far outmatched for the other team. So, I mean, when the first inning takes more than 30 minutes and then the second inning takes almost 30 the minutes. The kid behind us was figure, trying to figure I know. out he was doing like the algebra, math. <laughs> how long is this game going to go if we're averaging 35 minutes of exactly. first inning? Exactly. So it was it was rough. Um, what it felt like to me having it, – it, it was men against boys. It really was. It really it was. It felt that yeah. way. And no no disrespect to Victoria, but, no. you know, the, the, the way that these rosters got put together, Ron Rock just – had access to a lot of talent that they couldn't go anywhere else at such a late notice. Um, I was, what was impressive to me, because I saw them a week ago yeah. in a game that they lost, in a game they really weren't in. I think they lost nine to three. It feels like they're a team now. Yeah. And they were just 
pummeling them. I think it was ni- it was nineteen to two was the final. When you say men against boys, I mean not just talent wise, but physicality wise. Also, the 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 team from Round Rock was just bigger. They looked more grown and developed. Yeah, you made the comparison. It looked like Victoria looked like every team we watched play in normal. Right. Yeah. But just against. Versus Round Rock looked like what what Round Rock Express guys could normally look like to a certain <laughs> right. extent. I mean, yeah. maybe just a little bit younger, but yeah, they were, they looked like grown men. But the other thing that you pointed out that I thought was a really valid point was because Round Rock was able to pull so many kids from, from U of H, they were kids that have already been playing together for a yeah. while. And so they've already developed some chemistry versus Victoria's kids, I think were more spread out from all over. I think you, I think you're right. And one of the things that was interesting at media day was the manager, Chase Almendez said, not only had all of that happened, but he had coached 75% of them at, at, in youth baseball at different levels. So well, that definitely will make a difference. It as well. definitely made a difference. <laughs> I predict so. that round rock will roll to the championship. But it, but was it just fun to be back? I mean, because because Round Rock is a park we go to all the time. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I mean, it was extremely fun to be back. We have our traditions for what we do when we're at our favorite ballparks, and that is one of our favorite ballparks. Um, they did have a lot of our our normal eating concessionaire stations closed down, and I have to imagine it was because of social. It was either because of social distancing or because of staffing. You know, trying yeah. to keep costs cut down. But um, but yeah, I mean, we got some great dogs. Nolan Ryan beef. Go, go Nolan Ryan. Go, go Nolan. <laughs> and then uh, Jessica wanted to. And then we have we have our other tradition. When we leave the ballpark, where oh, do we hit up? We always go to Andy's Frozen Custard. Yeah. Shameless plug for somebody who doesn't actually sponsor the show. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. Maybe they should. You know what? Maybe they should. Yeah. Andy's Frozen Custard. Get it on the ground floor. It is. I, you can have a ad space for free snow monsters. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, it's delicious ice cream and it's pretty much the highlight. We only go when we're at a game because it's so far away from our actual house. Yeah. We wouldn't just normally drive by, but mm, good custard. But I do hope that, you know, people watching this, I think that they have after tonight only 13 home games left. Um, it did feel completely safe. It feels um, it felt normal. Mm-hmm. which right now is is all you can ask for. Um, one of the things before we leave, I thought it was cute. You're the one who noticed the players from Victoria oh, when yeah, they got into cute. the Dell. Yeah, so they were lined up. Um, they were batting, and so they were lined up against the dugout railing and all just leaning up, and you could just see them sort of looking around. And I just it just felt like they were in a big stadium for the first time. Yeah. It was it, really great. And it was cute, and it reminded me uh, of what Andrew Feltz from the Round Rock Express had said, you know, before Meaty Day happened. We had talked. And he, was on our, he was on the show. And he said it was their goal to make these kids feel like big leaguers. And I think, you know, I think all in all, um, to use the world's worst pun – on a baseball show at all levels, the Round Rock Express or the Round Rock Harry Men, they have hit a home run when it came to handling this this pandemic and the yeah. transition to the TCL. Absolutely. It was a great time. And it's out of here! The Let's Get To moment of the week. And now Ryan Hernandez, the big right-hander from Boston, Massachusetts, stands in from Boston by way of the University of Houston, and he takes a ball high. The catch takes a few steps towards the mound, tossing it back to the pitcher, no doubt giving words of encouragement to this embattled pitching staff. And the pitcher digs in, cleaning out his cleats. Ryan's a big Red Sox fan, had a little fun with him at media day, teasing about the Astros as the pitcher digs in the stretch. He looks, takes a sign and comes set, and the pitch, and it is high again. Hard to be high on a guy like Ryan, he's so tall, but that is exactly what's happened on two consecutive pitches. The Round Rock Harry men are having their way with this pitching staff tonight. I like to think it's that home cooking. And the pitch. And Ryan hits it deep and far. This one's got a chance, kids. And this ball is gone. Touch them all, Ryan. That's a monstrous home run from the big right-handed hitter from Boston, Mass.
He rounds third. The ovation coming from his dugout. He's having a good time down here in Round Rock, Texas. And I tell you what, Ryan, we are having a good time watching you. And now to the dugout featuring Darian Sills Evans. One of my favorite people on the planet. He is a extremely talented screenwriter, actor, and director, which makes him a little unfair, actually, for the rest of us. Uh, Darian Sills Evans, um, who was quarantining out in California. How's it going, man? Pretty good. Pretty good. As good as quarantine can go. Thanks for yeah. having me uh, back on. Well, you are. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, you were on last season. And uh, I kind of wanted, now that we're doing video, to kind of, we're big time now. We're a series. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. I, um, I want to talk a little bit about your history with the game because I know you got a Brooklyn shirt on. I mean, so you're not from LA. Um, you are a fan of one of the greatest banes on my personal existence. <laughs> sure. But tell me a little bit about just how you got into the game in the first place. Uh, I am from Brooklyn, New York. I got into the game, uh, in 1983 when my grandmother and my grandfather took me to Shea Stadium to see Tom Seaver lose against the Dodgers. And, uh, we sat in the mezzanine and brought our own sandwiches and sodas like you were allowed to do back then and, uh, had a great time and I've been a fan ever since. And, um, my grandmother was a Mets fan. My grandfather was a Cubs fan. And uh, I've remained a Mets fan. It's, it's a bit harder since I've been in L.A. now for seven years. When I go to Dodger Stadium, I do root for the Dodgers unless the Mets are in town. So. I think that's I, – I actually think in, in a world that needs nothing but love, I think that's beautiful. I think that's fair. I think you can do that. Well, growing um, up, I always understood that if I had to root for another team, the only other acceptable team would be the Dodgers. Uh, at least according to my grandmother, because of Jackie Robinson. So, right. and because I, they are from Brooklyn. No matter where you put them, Brooklyn, I still feel like they're the Brooklyn Dodgers. Um, I don't know if you remember her from our uh, Joy Shots. She's one of right. our, our writers. So her dad quit watching baseball when the Brooklyn Dodgers left. <laughs> He's still with us. He still doesn't watch. I mean, that's like de- wow. that is some <laughs> dedication. Uh, I don't even know how you how you fix that. Um, you know, you, you mentioned um, what I think was interesting. You mentioned your first game, and you remember that your team lost. Yeah, baseball's really about pain, isn't it? It's a lot about pain, and you know, the Mets in '83 were a particularly bad team. So, and so are the Cubs, for that matter. So, all I remember my grandparents just constantly lamenting the teams that they had chosen to follow. And uh, in 83, the Mets got Tom Seaver back from Cincinnati. And, you know, Tom wasn't as sharp as he was, you know, he wasn't, he just, he just wasn't throwing as hard, you know, he was older and yeah, the decline was starting and it was obvious. And I remember he lost four to one that day. Um, but it was only a few more years before the Mets would turn it around completely. So, yeah, I've got my 1986 National League West pennant on the wall. Oh I'll yeah, sure I get, maybe I'll throw an insert of that into the video <laughs> so you can tap dance on it or whatever. Um, but yeah, so you you so put in perspective then because you got you and I are roughly the same age. Um, I know that you. I lost. I know friends of mine, Jessica's dad, for example, who gave up on baseball in '94 after that happened, yeah. how much worse would it have been if there was no baseball played because of money within, with, with two things in the backdrop, the pandemic. And um, we had a guest on talking about the bad look major league baseball got negotiating in the press without even addressing what happened to George Floyd. Mm-hmm. Like, so how much worse would it have been? And is it still kind of worse? You think how much how much worse would it have been if we had not had any baseball? Yeah, ownership? arguing of over and over money in this particular climate. I, I think it would have been much worse. I mean, arguing over money in this in this climate right now, if anything, should make us all look within ourselves and realize what's what's really important. And uh, the negotiations were kind of an embarrassing 
for MLB. They don't really need any more embarrassment right now. And if you put the George Floyd thing into account, I kind of take it back to where has MLB been in the black community for the last 20, 25 years? There's been a real problem with the way that they seem to market to African-Americans, if, if at all. And, um, you know, when I was growing up, there were still 20, 28% maybe black ball players in the league and now uh, African-American anyway. And now what are there? Was it 3% African-American? Yeah, 3 or 4%, players? I think. Yeah. So... <clears throat> There, there isn't really a lot of outreach, it seems, in MLB, and, and they are, there should be. I mean, I, I think there's an opportunity to do what the NBA has done in terms of embracing that you have fans from everywhere, you know? Um, NBA really goes out after everyone and the league is fairly diverse. Yes. There's a lot of black guys, but there's a lot of Europeans and right. there's Indians and there's, you know, a lot of great white ball players and no one ever really challenges that the same way kind of gets challenged in, in baseball, which kind of breaks my heart as a, as a baseball fan and as a black American who loves the game, you know, it's not very cool to be, a black American who likes baseball right now. You know, it's interesting that you say that part then, because it is a sport that is losing fans at a, it's hemorrhaging fans. Yeah. And it seems like, like look at the microcosm of the Astros where our owner can't say a word and not be stupid about it from <laughs> right. we're, we're going to defend the, the guy who was a, a misogynist to cheating didn't help us whether it did or didn't, you just don't say that to, yeah. I need people to buy beer. They're dying. Like, but it seemed like that's a microcosm. Why, why aren't they reaching out to, particularly in New York where there's a high black population and a high history of the game. Right. You got to find fans from somewhere. Yeah. I think part of the reason that they don't reach out is just finances. You know, the thing about reaching out to a poorer community for this sport is you'd actually have to provide a hell of a lot of equipment for them to even be good. You know, one of the things I really wanted to do when I was growing up in the projects was play baseball and I couldn't because my family couldn't afford what comes with playing little league. You know, that wasn't something that was available to us, you know, whether it's the uniforms or it's the equipment or whatever you have basketball, you just need the ball. Mm hmm. And everyone else has, there's hoops everywhere. Um, Major League Baseball would have to make a huge commitment to not only <clears throat> going into neighborhoods that they've kind of avoided for the last quarter of a century, but also a financial investment in providing equipment to kids who want to play the game to, and, and to a certain extent, coaching. You know, there's, baseball's a game that's taught with, through legacy of, you know, not just fathers and sons or mothers and daughters, but it's also just taught through the idea of people being able to have the time and the equipment to pass it on to a kid. My first baseball glove was a glove that belonged to my uncle, you know? And uh, if you don't have that, you're never going to learn to love the game and, and, and appreciate it. My grandmother played semi-professional ball in St. Croix, which is why she liked the game and, you know, just hearing her stories of being a woman who was a pitcher was fascinating to me. And she taught me how to throw and she taught me how to catch. It wasn't my dad. So. That's first of all, incredible. I didn't know that about you. That's an, that's, that's amazing. Um, I do think the economics, it's interesting. It's almost like baseball's becoming lacrosse. Like even. Yeah. You know, I grew up not a lot of money and my dad would tell us well, we can't afford for you to play. I didn't play. I did not play until I was in middle school and it was a school team and all I needed was a glove and a bat and everything was great. Right. And then I've now that I teach these kids and I hear about summer leagues and, and, and you're right. It's, it's a, it's a billions of dollar industry, which is probably exactly why major league baseball won't do the outreach that you're talking about as needed. Yeah. And 
and they and they should because I think that there's I don't know I have a lot of cousins a lot of young cousins in my family who you know want to play athletics a lot of them go to football or basketball <laughs> and I'm always the the lone one in my family that's like if you like sports so much and you do like baseball because some of them do like baseball but they just don't want to play because it it's not cool and none of their friends are on those teams you know. Mm. Um, you should pursue it. You know, there's one on the average baseball players have a longer career than those other sports. And uh, if you really want to do it and I don't know, there should be someone going out, out reaching to people saying to young black men, you know, there's another way to get out. If you can throw this white ball really far, who knows, you know, what happened. If you can throw it far or hard, or catch it really well, or run really well, you can, you can do this sport, you know, and not have a concussion, or not, <laughs> not blow out, not be in danger of blowing out your knee every other right. day, you know? <clears throat> so, and you can actually start making money earlier and longer in the sport, because you still, and I think minor leagues will eventually start getting paid better. Um, right. one, one curveball I'll throw you, because we, you know, it was something I didn't, think we were going to talk about when I sent you what I thought we'd talk about, but we are talking about the hundredth anniversary of the Negro leagues. Mm -hmm. You're a filmmaker. You're always, I mean, I know you've always got baseball ideas. Mm -hmm. What is it about this inability to get a really good movie made about that era of baseball? Um, Well, I think it has to do with, there's still a lot of shame in it. You know, I think that the people who, make those decisions and, and and also major league baseball who you'd have to get permission from to do it correctly or to do it with the scope that I think most film filmmakers want to do it. They're really embarrassed and ashamed at the, the scar. It's just like the scar of slavery on America as a whole. You know, this is a, it's a black mark on the game, you know, and there's still a lot of teams that, for whether they want to admit it or not, certainly have not evolved um, with that. You know, if you look at, if you look at like integration in baseball and how many teams like miss the opportunity to be the first or, and the teams that, and the teams that were the last, you know, a lot of those cities are still, racially divided cities. I mean, like Boston was the last, right? And Boston is, for for all of its liberal voting, a pretty racist town, you know? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know what it will take for, to, for us to get a really good movie out of it. I mean, I guess it would take someone who is African-American in a position of power in the MLB to kind of, say let's do these stories the MLB is really weird when you try when it comes to trying to do movies about events that happened under major league baseball you know um even when I was researching MLB stuff for this thing that I'm writing now they don't like to get involved with things that put them in a negative light like if you want to do something about ten dollar beer night that's bad (laughs) because they they don't want to look bad the same yeah. way that iPhones doesn't allow the villains to have an iPhone in a movie, you know? I never knew that. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's true. The villains cannot have the iPhone. Um, the MLB doesn't want people to be reminded of mistakes that they've made. But it's the mistakes that they've made that have, have aided in their redemption of the sport and makes it the league that it is today. I mean... Yes, there were mistakes were made with race and mistakes have been made with outreach. And, but if you always take it from the point of view of you're an evolving league and you're always going to get better, you don't have to be ashamed of the mistakes. And, I, and again, I, I hate to keep bringing up the NBA, but they at least seem to be at the forefront of the sports leagues, the major sports leagues. They cop to mistakes that they made or make, and they seem to be extremely progressive and what, where the, where the game and where commerce in the game for the fans will go instead of 
waiting back to see what's going to happen, they, <clears throat> they, they change with the times quicker than the NFL or the MLB does. Yeah, it's interesting because even, you know, even the NFL, I, I know the NBA took a lot of heat and I think justifiably so, so, so with the, with the China stuff and, yeah. you know, how much of our own values as a country are willing to sell down the river to make a buck in a new market. And that's a, that's right. a conversation for another day, but even Goodell now admits without mentioning his name, what happened to Kaepernick was wrong. And yet in the MLB, we're still dealing with building with Marge Schott's name on it. Right. Yeah. You right. know? And it does, it does seem like they would go a long way from, and first of all, I find it ironic that they control the Negro league property anyway, since. I don't know how, I don't know how that happened. And that might be something to look into. I wonder when they bought all of that stuff. How did they, how did they wind up being the controllers of all of that? But, but they are, but they are. So uh, as we kind of wrap up, you know, your Mets, first of all, I had picking, I, I had them pick to win the East. Um, don't laugh. I really, now, although I don't know what it's like in the 60 game <laughs> tournament they're going to play, but, but I just felt like eventually that pitching is going to come together and it's going to be something that you can't stop. Um, but the talk of possibly a rod and J Lo buying the team, um, you'd said something about full-time Dodger fan. If it happens, is that, <laughs> I, I probably, uh, I probably would uh, become a full-time Dodger fan only because I find those two personalities, they're just so much, there's so much celebrity that it's unbearable to watch, but really, I guess they can't be any worse than the ownership we've had. New York has a problem with sports ownerships. They're either, they're either too ruthless like Steinbrenner, too mean like the Dolans and the Knicks, or they're just incompetent like the Wilpons. Right. And that just, it, it's it's a bad scene for sports ownership. And so the Wilpons have already, they've run this team into the ground at this point. Um, I can't believe they were going to hire Carlos Beltran. I can't believe they hired him. How about a, you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> it just seems like another colossally bad idea, but he's gone now. And if there's if there's a chance that someone like J Lo or A Rod could take over, who knows? I can't believe that A Rod would be more than a face. He doesn't mm-hmm. seem like he would. I don't know. I know he has a big ego and stuff, but I can't believe that he would be like a Steinbrenner type of uh, owner who would be a kind of secret GM. You know, I think yeah. he would own the team and just kind of sit back and make his appearances and collect his checks. I don't think he'd he'd care about it all that much. And certainly I don't see J-Lo, you know, <laughs> orchestrating trades. <laughs> I just think it's weird that he'd become a Met because that's a, you know. Right. That's a, I can't imagine, it'd be like, hey, I used to own the Rangers and now I'm going to run the Astros. No. Right. You're not. Well, well, Jeter is like what? He's in Florida, right? Yeah, I just feel like that's so different than that New York thing that yeah. Mets are always it's just like, going right across the river to the yeah. Mets. There's that chip on your shoulder. Um, <laughs> well, because I mean, the Astros came close to hiring the ex-Rangers manager, who honestly would have been a perfect fit. But like, right. if you looked at paper, uh, uh, look, we love having Dusty Baker, and I think the reason they hired him, yeah, veteran team and will willingly take all of that heat. In fact, I'm worried about him not being able to manage with COVID. Like if I'm 70, yeah, do I roll into this? Um, I guess as we wrap up then, 60 game season, legit, not legit, or are you just glad it's baseball? It's going to have to be, you know? I mean, if, if we want to have any type of baseball at all, it's going to have to be legit and we're going to have to get a, the fans that have a chip on their shoulder about it are going to have to kind of get over it and enjoy what we have. You know, this will be, a historical season for a lot of sports and it might be if it has an asterisk next to it the entire season because it was this shortened thing then it does but i I'm, I'm excited to just see some games i mean i play for i pay for the damn mlb channel i want i want to see like a, a real game on it and uh not just like watching classic games or you know i dug out like uh my uh 86 world series a couple weeks ago just to watch game six, you know, and, uh, you know, that's what it's come to. 
Go Go Astros, a focus on H Town Hardball. All right, we we're back on Go Go Astros to talk about another chapter in the chronicle that is MLB against the Astros. And I know that we are actually not the only team with this gripe. Um, Scott's Cardinals, they have seven games in Milwaukee and seven games in Chicago. Uh, Andy, your first blush looking at the schedule, what were your thoughts? Um, my first blush, and as much as I would love to live in a fair and equitable world where everybody is treated um, equally and justly, um, I'm also 48 years old, and I realize that's not really a thing. Um, so you can kind of expect um, some teams are going to get screwed. And to be fair, before we go into this, every team's, with possible exception of one, has uh, pretty legitimate gripes about their schedule uh, because it's 60 games crammed into 66 days or 70 days. Uh, it's going to be hard and it's going to look uneven. Uh, and of course, Major League Baseball being um, as super smart as they are, made it as hard as possible on themselves by trying to make five game series here and three game series here and a couple of two game series uh, here and there instead of just sticking to, you know, five at home, five on the road, da da da. Um, the Astros, on the other hand, having given you that caveat, uh, my gripes with the schedule um, is that uniquely to them, amongst other what I would consider contenders, um, have a stretch where they play 17 consecutive games with no break. Um, only the Dodgers have that. No other team has that. Um, and I'll be, I looked at probably 10 teams. So of the, of those 10 teams, um, they also have two nine game road streaks or road um, series, uh, which no other team has the um, and, and then, you know, in addition to just the moronic things of playing the A's three teams at home and seven games on the road and the angels, four games at home and six games on the road. And if you look at the standings, that's reasonably who you would expect to be our biggest competition. So they put MLB has put the Astros at a distinct disadvantage. On the contrary, if you're the Yankees, um, you get to play seven of 10 at home against the Red Sox and six of 10 at home against the Rays, which again, you would think is your primary competition for the division. Uh, Their longest streak of away games is seven games and it only happens one time. Um, And their longest period without an off day is 15 days. And they finished with something like 20 versus of the last 26. Oh yeah. uh, With teams that have lost 95 games or more in previous sequence seasons. And they get to close up at home for nearly two weeks where the Astros will be strictly on the road. Uh, you look at the Dodgers and they have similar advantages, seven to 10 against the Giants at home, six to 10 against the Rockies. Um, their longest streak of away games is seven games. They do that one time. And um, it's, there's certainly an equity. And, you know, looking at the Cardinals, which – for all of the world should be one of the glamour franchises of MLB. They get treated almost as badly as the Astros. <laughs> they um, really do. Sorry, Scott. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that it, it hard, it's hard for this not to feel intentional It hard. It's hard for it not to feel um, another attempt to punish the Astros for, you know, essentially committing. If they can't send them to the Hague, we're going to send them to Oakland. This essentially seems to be what's happening. Is there a reason for us to look at this? Look, the travel distance part of it, that is that has been the reality. You can make it feel better over 162. That's the reality. We live in the central time zone playing in right. the Western Division. That will get fixed. I don't understand how you don't just send them to Oakland for a five-game series and then bring Oakland for a five-game series and just be it that way. That makes far too much sense. We don't want to do, make sense. We want to have um, fun, weird things. And I think they make, I think that the schedule maker thought they were making a concession to, I guess, Houston and, and Arlington by um, making all of the West Coast start times no later than 8 10. So that was interesting. I thought that was a nod to the two teams in the Central who are going to have to deal with this. Um, but the start times are weird. They're all over the map. And it's almost like they realized, well, if we're not going to have fans, it doesn't matter when we start the games. We need to start it so some of the games during primetime television, but it honestly doesn't matter. So um, you've got a 8-10, 3-10, 1-10, 6-10. Those are your first four games in Houston. Yeah. How do you uh, think that this is going to affect the team's chances then? You know, ultimately talent when beats out talent. It's just like we've talked about. Um, there's a long – there's a much shorter road 
uh, with 60 games versus 162. So you've got to get off to a good start and you've got to play well for 60 games. There is no time. Um, all the fans on Twitter who overreact over every single loss and certainly any two or three game losing streak <laughs> will be legitimate. They'll, they'll have legitimate concerns this year because a three game losing streak in a 60 game season that you have too many of those. You've got a bad, bad run um, and you don't have any time to recover from it. Uh, back to your question, though, I, I think it is something that Astros fans can legitimately be concerned about. And I know we did a lot of weird stuff at the beginning of what should have been the season uh, with beards and mullets and all that. But there was some actual content in there. One of the things we talked about from a content perspective is the history of Major League Baseball um, screwing over the Astros, uh, certainly from 2005 on, but you know before that as well. Um, this is another piece of that. This is the same decision makers who decided the Astros can't be in any promotional videos after January 2020. Uh, can't be in any advertising. Can't we, we don't even talk about the Astros unless we can mention garbage cans. If we can mention garbage cans, then it's all Astros all the time. But other than that, we can't consider it. We can't talk about Jose Altuve being an MVP candidate. We can't talk about George Springer being one of the better, um, if not the best, probably behind Mookie Betts, but uh, free agents available. Uh, we can't talk about Justin Verlander. Um, He's the one who's the only one who really gets any run. Uh, but this is largely the same team that won the pennant last year, that won their division by a, a pretty good margin um, and honestly should have won the World Series, if not for an incredibly um, hot slash lucky Washington Nationals team. Um, how part of me when I saw the schedule immediately was over it. Don't even care if there's a season. Um, why should I be at least not that? I mean, I'm, I'm already, I'm already regretting the schedule doing, doing its thing and then trying to log into Twitter. Like today, a video was made from some Dodgers fan, a little boy saying, this is what happens when the Astros come to town. And he threw a fastball at the head of a Jose Altuve dummy and it, and it exploded. And I thought that's 2020, you know, in a nutshell, why should I be excited? I mean, baseball, um, any baseball, but I've got baseball. baseball. I mean, we do, but any baseball is better than no baseball. So more baseball is better than less baseball. Um, that, that's the reason to be excited. Uh, the Astros still have a very, very good chance of winning the pennant, making it three division, or excuse me, making it three division titles in a row uh, and getting to the playoffs and letting things happen. Um, I think they're at a disadvantage from a starting pitcher standpoint, but other than having not a fourth and fifth starter really defined, they're going to be a really, really solid team. Um, you're going to assume that Alvarez is going to get off the Island, wherever he happens to be right now. And Arquiti's allowed to cross the border, uh, at some point. Uh, and you're going to have a fairly um, complete team, um, compared to a lot of other, uh, rosters they're going to play. There's also a healthy amount of, um, competitive games. We do have four against the Dodgers, two at home and two in the road. One of those, one, that first series is in the first week. So we get to warm up against the Mariners. Um, and then honestly, putting all the nonsense aside, Astros Dodgers is a premier matchup in Major League Baseball in 2020. Those are two really, really well constructed teams that are, should do really, really well this season. Um, and then, uh, you know, you're going to have abbreviated though it is, you're going to have the joy of a, 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 what is a pennant race. Um, and even better, you don't have to see Arlington until September. <laughs> I do need to get a weed eater out of there, though. So I mean, I literally, I haven't. I won't have to look at that whatever tinted brisket that they're going to be playing in until <laughs> the very last week week of the regular season. I was talking to our buddy Steve Stu Clary, you know, who does our a, our kind of our A's insider, and even he feels like the Astros got screwed. And he tried to kind of calm me down by saying, "Listen, the only thing that makes Oakland hard to play in is the fans, and there will be no fans." Uh, do you think that the lack of fans kind of negates some of the home field advantage a little bit? Oh, absolutely. Um, and it's interesting because I was talking about the start times. And if you look towards mid December or mid September, um, the start times start looking normal. So we play the Rangers. Those games start at seven o'clock uh, when we play the D backs that starts at seven and six. So it's almost like they're trying after, you know, end of August to get the games back in a normal television schedule type thing where you might actually have fans. Um, so I guess that potential is still there, even though it's probably getting smaller every day. 
But without fans, it's just baseball, and ultimately the talent wins. Um, and even over 60 games, ultimately your better teams are going to win. 60 games is roughly what a college team, a good college team will play in a given season. Um, the Longhorns, when they're good, the Aggies, when they're good, um, most of the SEC doesn't have a problem winning games over a 60-game season. Um, I don't anticipate the Astros, the Dodgers, the Yankees, a couple of others um, – have any issues with winning games so it's ultimately a, a situation of talent beating talent and I would put a, our talent up against any other team right now I, I guess that's true I mean I I mean I don't guess that's true like I still I even think that our talent is more proven and deeper than anybody but the Dodgers right like the Yankees have Cole but they don't have a whole lot of el- else in their starting rotation I mean the, the Tanaka hit was horrific and who yep. knows when when he comes back and I was really just dis- dis- disgusted in some Astros fans who were of course being very Astros fan on Twitter about it. Um, so right now the Astros really have three question marks, Joe Smith, Jordan Alvarez and your Kitty. Um, who, who do you think we're going to, who do you think is going to be hurt the most by not being in camp already? Um, Joe Smith has a proven track record of major league baseball performance. I'm not worried about him. He's one of the most undervalued relievers over the past five years in major league baseball. Uh, When you look at the end results of his season, uh, he suffers a lot from um, what I consider the myopic views of baseball player, baseball fans who that relief pitcher blew that lead. So he's horrible. And they carry that with them for an entire season, even if they literally never give up another run or hit. Oh, he's horrible. I blew that one game in, in June. Uh, super. Um, I think Arkady is probably hurt the most. Uh, we need him to be a fourth starter. Um, and I'll go back to Arkady in just a second. Alvarez, I assume, can hit just when he stands up. His issues were his knees. The longer he's sitting out and healing those knees, the better off he's going to be. That's kind of where my assumption is with him. Um, he's young. He's going to be our DH. He doesn't really need fielding practice. There's no need to play him in the outfield in a 60 game season. No, not at all. You don't have anybody to rest up. Um, I would see, you know, you're going to see heavy amounts of Springer, Altuve, Correa, Bregman every day, all day, because there's no, there's no point in resting them over 162 games. Um, Arkady is the one who suffers from not being in camp because he needs a, just to get his reps in, but B uh, he's in a competition to be one of the last two starters in, in the rotation. And if he's not there, he's going to be in the bullpen because you've got other options you have to go with, you have to go, you're going to have to go um, with the guys who are there. So that that's the problem for him. And again, we have starting pitching candidates. We just don't have experienced candidates. So, right. You know, but, I, but the, I go back to my point earlier that most teams don't have most teams, fourth and fifth starters are either a candidate or a journeyman. They're very rarely what the Astros have luckily had, particularly in 18 when you had an ACE for almost for the whole rotation, really. Yeah. And then, you know, hindsight being 2020, how much better would we feel had we signed Charlie Morton? But yeah, no, I, yes. I mean, there's Absolutely. a lot of things I like that Jeff Lunau did. That's probably the thing that's, and I know why. I know the reason, history of injuries, age, weren't sure about his desire to continue play. Um, but we have an entirely different conversation right now about not being as good as any other team, but literally being the best team in baseball if Charlie Morton's in our rotation versus Zach Greinke. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's interesting um, because I don't feel like it's that big a fall off from Granky to Morton or Morton to Granky, but we'll see. I guess as we wrap up then, I mean, if you were placing a bet today, would you pick uh, pick us to win the division? Um, if there is a season to play, because we still have two full weeks to go. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I still think we're we have to be the odds on favorite to win the division. to close it out, the right-hander from Houston, Texas, James Christopher. And that wraps us up for this episode of Let's Get To. We are out here at Harryman opening night for the home opener. Right now, they are putting it on the Victoria Generals 18-2 to going into, we're in the top of the sixth. 
A lot of wood was chopped tonight by the Round Rock Harry men. We want to thank everybody for watching this episode. I want to thank the good folks at the Sugarland Skeeters for having us out to Media Day. Thank you to Darian Sills Evans for joining us to talk a little Mets. And thank you again to Andrew Feltz and the team behind the Round Rock Harry men for having us out for opening night. I do want to do a special shout out to Round Rock, the team at the Dell Diamond. They have done the social distancing thing so much better than anybody else that we've seen. Chairs are roped off, people are safe, everybody's wearing masks. It is a real testament to the team behind the Round Rock Harry Men, the Round Rock Express. Kudos for taking this very serious thing so seriously. Usually I do end the episode on Let's Get To, but I felt like this time I would let Pete and Cavilia take us out of the episode. We're back, baseball's here, man. I mean, it's, you know, apple pie, apple pie Chevrolet and, you know, baseball, man. I mean, it's, This is what we're supposed to be doing. Truer words were never spoken, Pete. Now let's get to 